Back in the 1950s, America faced a chilling threat. Soviet bombers armed with nuclear weapons could strike at any time. The military needed a game changer. Their answer? The XF-108 Rapier, one of the most advanced jets ever designed. Capable of flying three times the speed of sound and detecting enemy bombers over 100 miles away, it was meant to be America's shield against nuclear attack. But despite its cutting-edge design, this superfighter never left the drawing board. Join us as we uncover the story of the XF-108 Rapier, the unstoppable interceptor that never was. During the Cold War, America produced some incredible aircraft, and the Rapier was no exception. Designed to intercept Soviet bombers before they could strike U.S. cities, it was a marvel on paper, fast, high-tech, and deadly. Yet, despite its promise, the U.S. government canceled the project. To understand why, we need to look at the 1950s. While many remember the era for diners, rock and roll, and classic cars, it was also a time of constant nuclear fear. After witnessing the power of atomic bombs in World War II, Americans lived under the shadow of possible attacks. Flush with post-war funding, aircraft designers pushed the limits of technology, taking bold risks in what became known as the golden age of aviation. Experimental jets like the XF-84 Thunderscreech, the Lockheed XFV, and the flying saucer-like VZ-9 Avrocar emerged during this time. Among these daring designs was the XF-108 Rapier. Built by North American Aviation, the Rapier was designed to hunt down Soviet bombers before they reached U.S. soil. It could patrol 1,200 miles from base without refueling, using powerful radar and long-range missiles to destroy targets from 100 miles away. Engineers borrowed technology from the XB-70 Valkyrie bomber and past fighter jets to cut costs. But despite its potential, the Rapier project was scrapped in 1959. Why? Two major reasons. The Rapier could have been the biggest fighter jet of its time, but the project was scrapped. Why? Two reasons. Money ran out, and the Soviets shifted strategies. Instead of bombers, they focused on missiles as their main nuclear weapon. Before canceling the project, President Eisenhower crunched the numbers. A fleet of F-18s would cost taxpayers $4 billion, about $42 billion today. That was a huge price tag for a jet that might not even be needed anymore. Back in the early 50s, the Air Force wanted a long-range fighter. By 1965, they were working on the LX, short for Long Range Interceptor Experimental. It was meant to replace the F-12 and F-16. Their wishlist for the jet? Ambitious. It needed to fly 11 miles high and break 1,000 miles per hour. It had to travel 1,000 miles without refueling, carry cutting-edge radar to detect bombers 60 miles away, and be powerful enough to take down three in one mission. These were bold demands but the Air Force was designing a jet to counter nuclear bombers. They needed something exceptional. Eight companies pitched designs, but by October 1955, only three remained. North American Aviation, Lockheed, and Northrop. North American's NA-236 showed real promise. It resembled what would later become the XF-108, with some tweaks like small tail fins and extra forward wings. Then, in May 1956, everything changed. By 1959, the Air Force officially killed the Rapier project, but the work wasn't wasted. The Navy borrowed many of its design elements for the A-5 Vigilante, a smaller but functional jet. Originally a nuclear bomber, the Vigilante later became a spy plane, swapping weapons for cameras. The Rapier never flew, but its influence lived on. Meanwhile, Hughes Aircraft kept refining its advanced targeting system and G-9 missile. That tech found a home in the YF-12. If you looked inside a YF-12's back seat, you'd see the same screens, controls, and HUD targeting system originally planned for the Rapier. The Rapier was built for long distances, loaded with fuel tanks, two in the body, five in the wings, allowing it to fly deep into enemy territory and back. It was designed to hit speeds near 2,000 miles per hour at 15 miles up, powered by twin J-93 jet engines the same ones used in the. The massive B-70 bomber was impressive, but speed wasn't everything. The Rapier had cutting-edge radar for its time. Its Hue and ASG-18 system, America's first radar, could distinguish between planes above and below but had one flaw. It could only track one target at a time. 
To improve targeting, infrared sensors were added to the wing edges. The jet carried three massive, long-range missiles in a rotating launcher inside its body. Each missile had its own radar, allowing them to hit targets up to 112 miles away, far beyond visual range. This gave it a sniper-like advantage when most planes were stuck using short-range weapons. Physically, the Rapier was one of the biggest fighter jets ever designed. 89 feet long, 57 feet wide, and 22 feet tall. Weighing 50,000 pounds empty and up to 100,000 pounds at takeoff, it was as heavy as seven elephants. Despite its size, it was a beast in the air, climbing at 45,000 feet per minute and flying 15 miles high. It had a combat range of over 1,000 miles and could fly nearly 22,000 miles without weapons. Even at low speeds, it remained stable, stalling only at 105 miles per hour, critical for takeoff and landing. During the Cold War, the U.S. attempted another high-speed jet, the Republic X-103, designed to intercept Soviet bombers. The Air Force ordered three test planes in 1954, but titanium manufacturing issues and an unreliable Wright J-67 engine caused delays. They cut the order to one plane, but when the engine failed completely, the project was scrapped in August 1957. After years of work, not a single X-103 ever flew. The F-103 got one last shot at life. The Air Force needed a testbed for advanced tech, new radar, a missile, and cutting-edge gear. Republic saw an opportunity, modifying their design to fit the equipment. But even with extra fuel tanks replacing some weapon space, the plane still fell short. The radar alone was massive. Its 40-inch wide antenna required a bigger nose section. Despite modifications, the project went nowhere. Instead, the Air Force tested their tech on a modified B-58 Hustler. Reaching extreme speeds in the 1950s was tough. Jet engines work by pulling in air, compressing it, mixing it with fuel, and igniting it. But at supersonic speeds, air needs to be slowed before entering the engine, generating intense heat. The turbine blades, the fastest spinning part, couldn't withstand extreme temperatures. With 1950s materials, speeds beyond 2.5 times the speed of sound were risky. Engineers had a fix, ditch the turbine and use a ramjet, a simple air-breathing tube that stayed cooler. Ramjet-powered planes hit Mach 4, but they had downsides. Massive fuel consumption and the need for an initial boost, as they only worked at supersonic speeds. Republic's chief designer, Alexander Kartveli, had a solution, a hybrid engine setup. The F-103 would use a Wright J-67 jet engine for takeoff and subsonic flight, then switch to an RJ-55 ramjet at high speeds. Special air tunnels directed airflow between the two. This system produced 40,000 pounds of thrust, balancing power and heat management. The aircraft featured a large intake under the fuselage with a distinctive forward-angled lip, a design later seen on the F. 105 Thunder Chief. Its delta wings, angled at 55 degrees, had a unique trick. They could tilt up and down where they connected to the fuselage, adding versatility to the design. Why was this feature necessary? Most planes must tilt their nose up steeply to take off or land. But this jet was so long that doing so would require extra tall landing gear to prevent tail strikes. Instead, Engineers designed tilting wings that let the plane stay level while adjusting for takeoff, landing, and even fuel-efficient flight. An ingenious solution. Behind the tail fins were two pedal-like air brakes that opened at a 45 degrees angle to slow the plane down. Unlike many fast jets of its time, this one had no braking parachute. Originally, engineers planned a standard glass canopy for the cockpit but there were concerns it would slow the plane at high speeds. At the time, periscopes were seen as the future of supersonic flight, and the Air Force pushed for their use. But chief designer Cart Veli strongly opposed it, arguing pilots needed direct vision. He included both options in every design document, proving that the glass canopy wouldn't significantly impact speed. Think of it like driving. Would you rather look through a periscope or a windshield? Like many 1950s jets, the XF-103 was ahead of its time. Engineers had to dream big. The Soviet threat was real, 
and America needed cutting-edge tech. But with dreams came challenges. Special metals were hard to work with, and the engines didn't perform as expected. By the time solutions arrived, the world had moved on. Still, these paper planes weren't wasted efforts. The innovations they pioneered, like combining different engine types, helped shape future aircraft. Even today, we use ideas born from these ambitious projects. The XF-103 never flew, but it reminds us that pushing too far, too fast can leave you with only blueprints. Yet even failures can lead to future breakthroughs. Thanks for watching. Click the link on your screen to check out another video. See you there.